Hey everyone, Mark Buckley, founder of the FMA Strength Institute, here again for episode number four with the beautiful Jimena Gonzalez. This is all about looking good because you feel good. This is all about healing your painful relationship with food and body image. So once again, thank you for joining us, Jimena. I know that you've got a wealth of information you want to share with the group today. So yeah. hello, because you feel good. Hello. So I've got a bit of feedback there again. I hate hearing the sound of my voice. So yeah, pick up some, if you hear any feedback, it's because Jimena's just in the other room. Um, we're trying to create the illusion that we're talking from two different places, but we're actually in the same apartment. All right, so we're coming in there. So guys, like always, you know, we're here to talk about the things that most people don't want to talk about. We're going to start really peeling back the layers of this and sort of help you become an expert in you, which is the message that Jimena tries to share with everyone. If you really want to stop having the things you don't want in life and actually start getting the things you do want, it's all about taking your power back. It's becoming an expert in you, and we talk about how you can achieve that through self-parenting. All right, today's topic is really looking at something a lot more extreme compared to what we've been talking about the last few days, and this is this idea of trying to achieve these standards and fitness and beauty that are so extreme, women are literally dying to be beautiful, dying to try and achieve these ideals, which are just crazy. Right, so we're well, gonna... wait a minute. Women and men dying to be beautiful or fit. This is correct, women and men. All right, so guys, as we have this, right, this is a very interactive sort of talk show. So, you know, leave your comments below because I can see the comments coming up. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them and we'll do our best to give you an answer. All right, you can just see here we've got, uh, Teo, hey buddy, nice to see you. Hi. All right, so your questions will appear up on our screen so we can make sure we address them, which will be a lot of fun. All right, so dying to look beautiful, a problem that is sort of plaguing men and women today. So let's get into it. How extreme has this become, men? What, what's your, your experience with the length that women are going to in order to try and achieve these very unhealthy, unnatural ideas related to fitness and beauty? Well, as we spoke yesterday, um, the ideals are getting crazier and crazier and they go in every direction. Like in some cases, it's just getting ultra skinny. In other cases, it's becoming obese. And this is what some uh, women uh, are going for. Um, in other cases, it's being extremely muscular. In other cases, it's um, being extremely lean. These are all extremes, okay? And yesterday, they don't watch our presentation yesterday, we have uh, three other presentations, with, which I strongly suggest uh, you check out because it's gonna give you like the whole overview. We've looked at the psychology, we've looked at solutions already. I mean, there's there's many layers to this topic. So I strongly suggest that if you haven't already, that you um, check that out once you're done with this one. All right, so how extreme are we getting? I don't even know where to start. <laughs> because <laughs> this is just insane. All right, so let me start with, um, uh, okay. So I have a very good friend of mine who was a model. She was a professional model. And uh, it was funny, we were having a conversation once and, um, and now she's like a beautiful, healthy, holistic coach. And we were having a conversation and I asked her like, why did you stop modeling? And she said to me, because I got hungry, <laughs> and she just started laughing. So she started telling me that a lot of her colleagues, so I am reporting what she said to me. I don't know this. She said that they would eat cotton to fill themselves up, to give themselves, themselves a, self, a sense of fullness, and they would energize themselves through Diet Coke. And that was what some of these girls were on. Okay? Now, yes. yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is that, you know, as we've been exploring, like when your entire sense of self is attached to looking a certain way, and most importantly, when your career and your income are attached to it, then a lot of women are willing to do many things. And this is what I was talking about. Like one of the things that I experienced in the fitness industry is that, you know, a lot of the pressure comes from, I need to look this way. If not, the next one's going to come. They're going to kick me out. And so what am I going to do? So I have to kind of like succumb to all of these things, you know? And now that we're talking about that, 
um, I remember that um, you know one day I was actually in the in the makeup room. I was getting ready, and then one of the uh, one of the makeup artists looked at me and he goes, "Have you ever considered getting liposuction in your cheeks? Like your your face is very round." And I go like, "Can you even do that?" I don't think it's liposuction. I think that it's some kind of procedure where they take something out from your cheeks and then you look like that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and you know, the funny thing is like, I've always known that I had like a round shape. I mean, I see myself in the mirror, but like I never, I had never like looked at it like it's a defect or it's a problem or anything. Um, and you know what the interesting thing is? I was, um, as we were talking yesterday about Western A. Christ, um, the native people, that had proper craniofacial development actually had white, fa white faces and all their teeth fit. And now one of the ideals that people are chasing are the long faces. Um, and actually a long face will come with crowding of the teeth because you do not have the space. But, you know, how do we fix this? Well, we have children with braces. This is how they fix this. They take the teeth out, they do this, they put the braces on, they fix. But that is actually not a sign of health. So, you know, like... And, and you know what the funny thing is? Yeah, I have like a white face, but I don't even have enough of a white face to fit all my to fit all my teeth. I actually they actually had to take out my wisdom teeth because I couldn't even fit them. Do you know, you know what? I mean? It's crazy you say that. Sorry to do because it, it was the same. You know, children often inherit nutritional deficiencies from their parents, and this is why you know Western Price says that sometimes just you know a child being put on a healthy diet with organic food sometimes isn't enough because of the deficiencies that, that have been passed on to them, you know, from their parents. And I was the same. I, I was born to parents that didn't really have a good understanding of health and nutrition and that. And I carried through a lot of the deficiencies and I had everything you said. I had a very narrow palate, so I had the crowding of the teeth and the braces. I had narrowing of the, the na nasal passage, so I could not breathe through my nose and I had to get nose surgery. And I told you about that, where they actually lay me down, cut my nose, flip the back, and pulled out cartilage to create more space, trying to structurally fix what was going on for me. And then, to cut a, a long story short, didn't do shit for me. I still couldn't breathe through my nose. I still had problems. And then once I got introduced to what true health is and actually learned how to heal my relationship with food and eat a much healthier diet, now I can breathe through my nose, the condition's gone, um, and my health's improved. You know, it's, it's crazy how it, you know, what you're saying, people are trying to go back to what are the markers of poor health. And today that's become the marker of beauty. It, it, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's really funny that you mentioned that about the breathing, because when I was a child, you know, as I said in the first episode, I, I had asthma and I had many health problems. And, um, and I couldn't breathe through my nose either. And it was also fixing my diet that the problem was gone. And yeah. they also did some procedure where they burnt my cartilage or something. I, I don't even know. And it didn't work. And then just clearing my diet, and I'm, I'm, I can breathe perfectly through my nose. You think someone would have the wisdom to come out with something like, let food be thy medicine or something like that crazy, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, just dismiss what he said ages ago. It's old. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't apply today. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so yeah, so, you know, and this is a pressure, and this is the kind of thing. So then women are going in, and they're having these procedures. I, again, I'm not exactly sure what they take out. But that's what gives a lot of these women this type of um, look. So when you look at girls that have that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they naturally have it. Okay. Yeah. And again, we're trying to go for the like skinny look. Like there's no roundness to the face. That, and, and by the way, keep in mind, like you know, when you when your face looks very sucked in, that is going to add years to your life eventually. You know, so <laughs> yeah, so we don't consider these things. So anyway, so that's one thing, like um, those types of cosmetic surgeries. And in the first episode, I was also talking about how a lot of little girls, um, and I say little girls, like 15 year olds and so on, are going in for Botox and other procedures so that they can get the perfect selfie, you know, and altering their lips as well. Like, what does a 15 year old need Botox? Well, because apparently they can kind of like lift certain parts of your face. So, like, if you have like a little bit of a droopy eye or something like that, they can kind of lift it. But what are we doing? We're actually paralyzing the muscles that allow you to express emotion. And 
I don't know if they've done research into this, but you know, like the entire system is connected. And so one of the ways in which we express emotion is through micro expressions, through our face, uh, through, uh, through our face. Um, and, and what we do with that face. And so I'm just very curious to know if that has an impact on our feelings, our ability to feel, our ability to express emotion. And by the way, if you go to my um, Facebook page, I have two articles talking about potential dangers of it. Because again, oh, it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. But, um, you know, when there's money to be made, I always question <laughs> you know, the, the whole thing with uh, the safety. So I'd just be very skeptical and keep in mind that botulism is one of the most dangerous toxins yeah. Um, yeah. on the planet. Yeah. And, and some of these women that, as they report in the articles that I have on my uh, wall, uh, some of these women have actually had the poisoning um, yeah. Yeah. from it. So, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and before about memorizing the most for any of my students, yeah, this is a good opportunity to check out what's called the polyvagal theory um, or, the, or the vagus nerve because there's a, a ventral branch that innervates pretty much all the muscles in the face and the voice and things like that. And when you think about what we talked about earlier with the reptilian brain, remember we talked about we have these basic needs for like connection being a major one and to always move towards acceptance and try to avoid rejection and why a lot of fear rejection. Well, remember the reptilian brain is all about familiarity. So when someone strange comes along, it's a reptilian brain in 0.7 seconds has already weighed that person up as friend or foe. Are they going to help me or hurt me? Are they one of us or one of them? All this happens at a subconscious level for survival. All right. So when someone walks up to you and they've like mummified their face and they show no facial expressions whatsoever. I'm happy. I'm sad. Yeah. That creates disconnect. Just like, you know, when we talk about sales calls, one of the most important things you learn to do is tonality, use the tone in your voice, because it's not normal to talk with just one tone repeatedly like that. That creates like a threat. It's like, this is not normal and we want to move away from someone that does that. So what I'm noticing is that with all these procedures, you know, I call it beauty by design, right? They're trying to design their looks to fit these ideals and they're doing crazy like Botox and paralyzing muscles in the face. We become expressionless and the consequence of that is disconnect. Think about conscious parenting. If you've got children and your face is void of expression and it doesn't show emotion, right? It's going to affect the level of connection with that child. It's going to affect the relationships around you because we are disconnecting from people through how we communicate at a sub subconscious level, which is facial expressions and tonality in the voice and things like that. So this stuff has far reaching, you know, damage that no one's talking about. So yeah. be able to do that. And, you know, it, it's crazy because, like, communication, 90% is not verbal. Yeah. Not and, verbal. like, when we're in Miami, and, I, and like, it's funny, like, different places are so indoctrinated into this. Like, Miami, whoa. You know, I come from New Zealand, and we, we're pretty we're pretty easygoing in New Zealand. Like, we, we kind of, we're not that much into personal grooming. I mean, we, sure we do, but not to the extent that you start seeing in Florida and stuff. And, you know, I went to, to Miami with my wife, and, I met one of her friends, and the first thing she said to me seeing me was she looked at me and she goes, you need Botox, straight away. Just straight off the bat, I was like, what? Said, you need Botox, you've got wrinkles around your eyes, we, we need to get rid of those. And I'm like, why? I, I don't mind having wrinkles, you know? It's like, it's wisdom. It's, I've been on this earth for a while, I don't mind showing that I have wisdom, that I've accumulated, you know, some wear and tear. But it's, it's, it's the shaming of age. It's, it's the shaming of the inevitable, because yeah. we're all... Well, remember, it's, you can either live a life out of fear or faith, all right? People who are living a life out of fear, fear everything. They fear aging, right? They, they fear rejection from the tribe and all this sort of stuff. So everyone's trying to fit in, the little sheeples that we, we talked about. But why fear age? Age is actually a beautiful thing. If, if you look at indigenous cultures, they're the first ones to say it takes, it takes a whole village to raise a child. The elders had a place. They were the people of wisdom. You know, so why fear aging? Aging is a, is a part of life. Can I, can I add something to that that I think is very important, especially for women too, because, well, actually this is for women and men. And the thing, I think that one of the fears is that because now our society has become so work oriented and some of the people as they age, they feel like they're disposed of and moved aside. Um, I think that people are trying to hold on to their younger years uh, for dear life. And, um, you know, instead of us transitioning and really bringing back, honoring 
the elders for their wisdom and bringing back that space that they deserve within our culture. Um, my grandparents, my grandfather died at 101. My grandmother died at 94, 95. And they were part of the family. Like they were like, they were an integral part of the family. They had their role. And I can't remember my grandmother and you're ever going for any procedure trying to compete with the younger women because she hasn't had that rite of passage into that, you know, which is what happened, what's happening today. They're not having a rite of passage into first adulthood and then into um, their later years, into the, 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 the age of wisdom. Yeah. And, you know, and this is a thing from with ancestral cultures and, and women in ancestral cultures, like they would pass down wisdom. And you know what? Like as I do all this process, like I don't like to call myself even like a health coach. I use the term just because it allows people to understand my line of work. But the way that I see myself is I just see myself more like as an uh, elder who's passing down info, you know? And so you may think elder and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm in my forties and I want to talk to women who are in their twenties, who are in the thirties, who are going through all these dying to be beautiful procedures. And I'm here to tell you like from wisdom because of all the things that I've seen that I've lived, you know, like watch it. Is that really the best? Path. And I think that all of us should kind of like come back into that role and support each other and not shame each other because we're entering this phase in my life. I'm graying, you know, like I've got gray hairs. And yes, I, I covered them for a while because they're growing in really awkward patterns. So the reason why I have highlights is because I'm just letting them now come in in a more like organized uh, fashion, but they're going to come out. I'm going to let them come. You know, like I am not going to fight the inevitable. Do I put oils on my skin to hydra uh, hydrate them? Yes, but not things that are going to go against my health and my well-being. You know, it's about aging gracefully. It's not about trying to fight against the inevitable, which is the obsession that we have. It's not just with being beautiful and being fit. It's about being forever young. You know, instead of anti-aging, why don't we call it aging gracefully? For example, uh, and it, it's so true because you know you look good because you feel good, right? Happiness is something that's found within, not external to self. And we talked about that a lot in the, in the previous um, episodes. But you know, just saying that, I think it's relevant to mention here too, because we're talking about elderly and, and wisdom and, and aging gracefully. And that, you know, I read some work a long time ago by Carl Jung, who was a, a very well-known psychologist back in the days of Freud and stuff, and he talked about the cycle of life. And there's an ascending phase and a descending phase. I'm going to be very, very quick with this, but I want you guys to start thinking about this now. When we're in our 20s, we're in our ascending phase of life, and we don't think about mortality. We don't think about death, all right? And you look at most guys, this is the, the young, dumb, and full of cum phase that they go through, you know, very ego-driven about authority and competition and conquest and things like that. But in our ascending phase, right, we, we tend to not think about the fact that we're even going to die. It's not even on our radar. But when you start getting to the top of that ascending phase, sort of like around 30s to 40s like this, that is when for the first time you're sort of confronted with this idea of mortality that one day you're going to be leaving this earth plane. And this is when a lot of the, as we talk about it, that crisis itself happens where people have this midlife crisis. And the reason behind that is because when you look at indigenous cultures, remember the elderly had a place. They had wisdom. They usually did a lot of spiritual counsel. They would grow you know, the spiritual side of the person. So as we got older, we could transition with grace into our next phase of, of reality, which is to now move into the elderly, you know, sort of position and take on counsel and, and be someone of wisdom. We don't have that in Western society today. We shame our elderly. They're a nuisance to society. And now all these people hit their 30s to 40s, Right? They get to the top of that ascending phase, where they're now going to start dropping into the descending phase, which is now the transition towards elderly and death. And when they have to look inside for the first time, they're forced to look within to see what is there. There's nothing there, right? Because there's been no spiritual preparation, no spiritual growth, no spiritual awareness. They're locked into this physical reality or this physical idea of the world, and they haven't grown the spiritual side, right? So they feel lost, and it creates more fear more yeah. isolation, less connection to source, and it creates this crisis of self. And we see this over and over again, and the first thing people do is they try to defy aging. 
They go, okay, this is not going to happen. I'm going to Botox my face and dye my hair and dress young. And I'm going to leave my wife and I'm going to go after a younger girl because, you know, you're as young as the girl that you date. And, and these completely go off the rails even more. So I'm not going to, I'll leave it at that, but just, you know, there's so many layers to this. We, we only get a, a chance to sort of touch the surface with you guys and we're just trying to plant the seeds. But really the take home message that everything was saying is build self-esteem, not others' esteem. Learn to connect with your own inner authority. Stop outsourcing authority. Stop outsourcing responsibility and learn how to grow into your own greatness and become an expert in you and actually have a very healthy relationship with the one person that matters, and that is, I mean, yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah, have a healthy relationship with yourself. Okay. You know, and I have seen some, um, just to close on the topic of aging, I have seen some uh, elder women who take care of their bodies, and they look amazing. Just letting themselves age gracefully, and it's beautiful. You know, it's like the seasons. You know, this is this is like a, a like a new season, and and it can be beautiful too. So so yeah, and and the thing is, you know, what what drives the whole thing, and I think the biggest concern is that it is driven by fear and it's driven by pain. You know, and and I think you know, like we can patch the pain and we can patch the fear by covering ourselves up with all these things, but we need to actually look inside and we need to look at this. All right, cool. So um, so we've spoken about some of those. Um, obviously facelifts and all of these things and um, I don't know if you guys have actually seen um, like that a lot of these women start getting very obsessed not all but very obsessed and each time they're going for more and more and more and there are women that have like 20 30 plus and men too cosmetic procedures Wow yeah like actually going under the knife. And there's been also the examples of uh, some characters that want to imitate Barbie that, you know, um, or actually another one that was pretty extreme that we saw the other day online were these girls that had breast implants and they connected something to their breasts and the breasts glowed in the dark. Yeah, the sailing so, girl would become like a fluorescent bulb and their breasts yeah. would glow fluorescent pink and purple and that, yeah. But yeah. look, look good at, at the raves that we're going to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But have you we noticed, like we're in the era now, and this is what fascinates me, again, this is just something I've noticed, but we're moving into the era of artificial intelligence. Okay. You notice that the way that women are starting to model themselves and design themselves is looking more and more like an artificial intelligence. Yeah, when no expression in the face, you know, they, like robotic. Yeah, they, they look like these like plastic type man mannequins. And then you look at all the, we talked about that the other day, that the Photoshopping, you know, no more will I just take a selfie. I'm going to actually Photoshop that and take away anything on my face that makes me look human so I look more artificial because now the artificial look is in. I mean, I saw one girl post up a picture and I kind of laughed. I thought it was a caricature. And then I actually looked at it, no, it's actually her. What is wrong with her face? And then I realized it was one of those apps where she just basically smoothed out everything and stretched everything and, and you know, made it look like this artificial intelligence type theme. And it's just, what is going on? And it's, it's really interesting that you bring up that thing with the apps because this is what this is conditioning us psychologically for is to edit ourselves. It mm. can start very innocently with an app. And then what starts to happen is you start seeing your picture here with the app and the editing and your reality, how you really look. And then you may start craving, oh my God, like I don't look as good here. Maybe I'm going to go and I'm going to pursue this. Be yeah. careful because all of these things may start very innocently. They are typically presented to us and packaged in a way that makes us look like we're, or, or it makes us think that we're moving towards empowerment or that we're moving towards fun or that, you know, the sheep, sorry, the wolf is dressed as sheep. Yeah. Be aware. Yeah, and, and girls especially, you know, and, and guys as well, um, just, just take note, you know, we talk about psychological damage and we've talked about that a lot of people get into this because of this belief that is, I'm not enough. I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not going to be accepted. I'm going to be rejected. All this, but it usually comes back to it, I'm not enough. And let me give you a tip. 
if anyone here has ever known a bodybuilder that takes steroids and then decides to change. So they took steroids in order to get their emotional needs met by being big and people going, wow, that's how they got validated. That's how they had a sense of self, all right? What happens when they have to come off steroids and they start to get smaller? People start to look at them differently. Now, even before the conscious mind engages someone and someone goes, which is one of the worst things you can say, have you got smaller? Because that completely fucks with their head. It's like yeah. when they say to a girl, have you gotten bigger? Have you yeah. got, have you gained weight? <laughs> Yeah, well, remember, before your conscious mind even picks up any of that stuff, remember the subconscious mind is already reading. Remember, 0 0.7 seconds, and some researchers say 0 0.2 seconds, it's already picked up through the expressions and micro-expressions and tonality and stuff, what's going on for someone. You already form an opinion. So I'm telling you, if you engage in this behavior out of a fear of, I am not enough, and you start doing all this crazy editing your pictures, and you start presenting yourself a certain way in the virtual world, Guess what happens when people actually meet you in the real world? They may not say it, but they're going to look at you and they're kind of going to give you that, whoa, what the hell is this? this you look nothing like your pictures type of look. Your subconscious mind's going to pick up on it just like that, even though the guy or the girl might not say anything, and it's just going to push you even deeper into that, I am not enough, I'm being rejected, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So this whole, you know, trying to, you know, create beauty through design, it's just, it's, it's not worth it. Right? Because you're still leaking power massively into external ideas of beauty. You're still your emotional needs in terms of how I feel about myself in the moment is dependent upon whether these people approve or disapprove of me. So I'm going to keep giving my power away to seek their approval so I can feel good about myself. It's no way to live. You will never be happy always seeking other people's approval and trying to avoid their disapproval. Right? So yeah. please take that in mind. So just to go on to a slightly different topic now, Amy, because we talked about age and looks and stuff, but let's kind of go into the fitness industry a little bit. You know, this is another area. So, you know, let's go to the young people now, you know, and this is another area where people are literally dying to be fit or dying to look a certain way. So just yeah. start off, like, tell us some of the, the, the extreme things that people are doing in the pursuit of having the perfect body. I mean, this is crazy. When you start unpacking this shit, and you see what people are doing, it, it completely blows your mind. The, yeah. You're the go to. Yeah, I think that one of the, the main things that this shows is just really like a huge misunderstanding of health and its connection with aesthetics and just the body. Um, there's just a huge misunderstanding, I think, and this is why people are going down this path, you know, without even questioning these procedures. So, you know, um, I think it was two days ago, I was actually talking about tongue stitching. So I was mentioning a client, a 15 year old client that I had and her mother had taken her to a doctor in South America to um, stitch like a little piece of cloth on her tongue so that she would experience pain when eating and she was forced to be on a liquid diet with very little, um, with, the, with a small amount of calories and uh, while training intensely as well. This girl wasn't you know, she didn't have a lot of weight to lose. The mother would lock the fridge. I, I said that it was that she hid the food. She didn't hit the food. She would lock the fridge. Okay. Oh. Um, I also spoke about the scale. And oh my God, like, personally, the scale is like a little instrument of evil. I don't own a scale. I encourage my clients to throw it out because of the amount of clients that have had come to me with obsessions with numbers. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, when I first started my career back in 2000, I was a fitness director at a, at a vegan spa. I was vegan at the time. So I was a fitness director there. I worked under a doctor. And um, every time that somebody came into the spa, one of my jobs consisted in weighing them, measuring them, you know, so that we would monitor their progress during their stay. And um, it was really interesting because like you would always have to ask them also like what their goal was. I don't know why, but all of these women wanted to weigh 110 pounds. Ooh. Regardless of height, regardless, like I don't know where they got that number from. I don't know if it came from a celebrity. I don't know if it came from a magazine, where it came from. But they all wanted to weigh 110 and they were all absolutely obsessed with that number. And then I, I told also another story about another client whose mother 
had given her a number that she needed to meet um, with her weight. And that when she didn't meet that weight, like she would obsess monitoring everything that she ate. And when they would go shopping for clothes, she was like really horrible to her and tell her that she was fat and, you know, like all these things. Um, so yeah, I, of course, you know, everybody can take things to extremes, you know, like, um, uh, we can't speak in the language of absolutes and say that everybody's going to utilize the scale like that. But in my experience, I just think that what's the purpose? Who cares how much you weigh? Who cares? And plus, you know, if you are a woman um, and you have, for example, some muscle like I do, I'm probably obese <laughs> within the charts. Um, you know, and I'll tell you, when when I was vegan, I was a hundred pounds. I'm five. I'm almost five seven, and I was a hundred pounds. Okay, I'm like a um, hundred and thirty two. For those who don't understand pounds and understand kilos, I was 47 kilos. I'm like 60 kilos now. Okay. And, um, and, and it, I, I wasn't healthy. And I, I'll, I will talk about more about that and my weight and all that stuff back then. But, um, yeah, so I don't get on the scale. And the other thing is we're cyclical. Women are cyclical beings because of our menstruation. And so we're holding on to water some days, like maybe around the time that you're getting your period or for other women, it's during the time when they have their period. It varies from woman to woman. So this is going to make your weight go up slightly. It could vary three, four pounds, depending on the woman, two pounds, you know, you don't know. Yeah. So if you're monitoring this weight and every day you're expecting that also, if you're constipated, for example, if you're not evacuating properly, that's going to add weight. Yeah. to your body like i actually um i was speaking to a colon hydrotherapist and she was telling me that she's had clients lose eight pounds after colonic the amount of fecal matter that she pulled out of them okay so this is not necessarily you're not weighing fat which is what everybody thinks that they're doing and by the way like if you're having like fluctuations in your weight you know like um often like that it's typically water or what i just mentioned but in order for you to have changes in fat like that that's not that's not that easy that's not from one day to the next so what are we doing and, and, and this is the thing to me which you know with myself working in the fitness industry and training trainers and, and things like that it's getting out of hand like when i started back in the industry in the early 90s the ideals for what a healthy male body looked like and healthy female body looked like, you know, we could achieve that through Naturally. a high road approach. You know, taking a very balanced approach to nutrition and training and, and monitoring people's overall stress and all those sorts of things that we talk about. But it was achievable. The standards today are so freaking extreme that, like I said, you can't actually get there without engaging in extreme measures. So these women are coming in and these guys are coming in with these very unrealistic ideas around body image and they have these very unhealthy relationships with body image and food and they're prepared to take the low road approach and, like yeah, and it's the blind leading the blind because the trainers have this mentality as well and they're supposed to be the professionals and, it, and some doctors too they are the ones who are implementing a lot of these things yeah and that's what i want to touch on you know i always say to, to our trainers what got you in the industry why are you here because remember, we can't get what we don't have, we can't share what we haven't experienced. So if we've come into the industry through the low road approach, then we can only share the low road method with the clients that want to pay us to take them on this journey and this experience. And this is really important. And because we're talking about these extremes, like I said, you know, for most people to try and achieve these body standards or these image standards, they have to do crazy things. Look, look at the things that we were looking at today. All right, there's, there's all these things that Google, if you guys want to have your, your minds blown, get online and look at what the crazy diets out there. Now, a lot of these diets are being promoted by doctors. Now, yeah. we're not talking about learned helplessness a little bit later on, right? A lot of doctors actually have learned helplessness when it comes to the obesity epidemic. Most doctors today go, look, there's nothing we can really do, nothing seems to work, and they've pretty much given up. So yeah, they're they like cut and paste now. Yeah, and they're prescribing just the, the extremes and, and calorie deficits and all this sort of stuff that we know doesn't work. Like we've always said, you know, don't ask me how to lose weight, ask me how to lose the ideas or the beliefs that are keeping you committed to staying overweight. That's where healing takes place. 
and the habits. Yeah, so let's just talk about some of the extreme things that we saw today that, that women and men are actually engaging in in an attempt to try and hit these standards. Yeah, like, um, and actually one of the ones we saw today, I've actually also had clients that have gone for these procedures and inserted balloons in their stomach to yep. create, to minimize the space in the stomach so they eat less. You see, the whole thing is just an attack on appetite. There's just such a misunderstanding on appetite. If you're hungry, your body needs nutrition. The thing is that most people, when they're hungry, they just eat calories. Yeah. No nutrition, you need the calories and you need the nutrients. If you are starving, you're going to be hungry and you can be overweight. And what that typically means is you are starving at a nutritional level. Also, when you're very skinny, it could be that you're not absorbing the nutrients. So that's another way of starvation. You know, even if the, the individual is eating, they could have a parasitic infection. They could have um, absorption problems, digestive problems. I mean, you name it. All right. So uh, but it's an attack against appetite. Appetite is part of of our, of our um, biofeedback. You see, when an animal, or when a human feels hungry, that is a signal you need to go and get nutrients and you need to go and get calories, okay? The body is telling you, just like when you're thirsty, this is like doing things to suppress your thirst or doing things to suppress your sleep, which we're also doing nowadays, you know, with the caffeine and you know, and um, and the exposure to blue lights and stuff—that's not like a purposeful thing, but the caffeine is. And yeah. people are taking other drugs to stay, like the energy drinks, and you know, and some pills to stay awake uh, a long time and be able to study cocaine. You name it, you know. So we are just trying to um, damage all of our internal biofeedback mechanisms that are our friends, they are the ones that are guiding us and that are letting us know what our bodies need. So this attack against appetite, I, I think that needs to stop. You know, right. why aren't we educating people so that they can heal their relationship with food instead of trying to kill their appetite? But see, that's, why? that's the problem. I mean, we, and we go back and a lot of the people that are recommending these approaches are the very people that also outsource responsibility, who also have a very unhealthy relationship with body image and food. I mean, yeah. this, this blows my, my mind, guys. When, when you have someone who's in a position of authority, like a doctor who's prescribing people that are overweight to do these extreme measures, like, for example, one of them is what's called, they, they take a nasal gastric tube and they feed it down the nose of the people and it drip feeds protein and fat throughout the day of around 500 calories to 800 calories total to push them into a ketogenic state. And they, they say that you'll lose around 20 pounds in 10 days doing that, all right? They've got, because obesity and putting people under anesthetic is quite dangerous to do like stomach stapling and, and things like that, they've now found ways to get around that by getting them to swallow these balls, these little bags, and then they put a tube down the throat, fill the bag with water to take up space for the stomach, and for four months, it will minimize how much food they can take before they that was, fullness. Sorry, that was the balloon procedure that I was talking about that one of my clients used, and she ended up in the hospital, almost died yeah. due to complications from that. And this is like an approved, um, safe procedure. Yeah, there's another one where they're sticking tubes down people's throats, and then they're running these like uh, uh, equipment down there so they can actually start suturing the stomach. Again, not having to make it an invasive surgery where they cut through the abdominal wall, so it's not considered a surgery, but they're going down to the tube in the mouth and they're suturing, they call it like the accordion effect. They're suturing off parts of the stomach to, to make it smaller so people feel full quicker, right? What's the other one? People are injecting themselves with mere urine. So the female horse is pregnant, they're injecting themselves with the urine from these pregnant horses because the urine has what's called HCG in it, Right? And that tricks the female's body into thinking she's pregnant and it changes the metabolism and favors weight loss in terms of using fat. And by the way, they use that along with a 500 calorie diet. And yeah. the consequences of this is like, this is really messed up some women. And a lot of them, when they put the weight back on, it's just like, like if you yo-yo diet, you know, that each time it just gets worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So okay. like, they put on more weight than what they did um, before oh, they started. No, the metabolic damage is huge when you starve the body. But here's another one. Women are actually swallowing tapeworms. 
<laughs> the eggs. Yeah, tapeworms, because they want to infest themselves with a parasite that's going to start attacking the food in the intestine to steal the food. <laughs> So not only starving yourself from calories, but you're also starving yourself from nutrition again, like nutrients, and you lose weight because you basically starve because you're feeding parasites. And, it, and when I read this, it was fascinating because it said one of the side effects or the potential risk is death. That's pretty extreme. But people are doing this shit in an attempt to achieve these very unhealthy ideals and body image. But listen, let's go back to the spell that we were talking about two days ago. Like, like for example, we spoke about the beauty spell, but let's talk about this. When you are watching television in the US, for example, and you see the advertisement for medications, so you've got this problem, whatever it is, and then they give you this list of side effects that are absolutely horrendous, probably worse than the condition to begin with, and some of them even include death, and yes. people are conditioned to go into their doctor's office to request this. This is the spell, this is the programming. Yeah. You know, like it happens at so many layers, but then it also acts out or plays out at uh, many other layers, such as this, you know, side effect death, like, why? Yeah. Why, why are we doing this? There's, there's so many ways, so many ways, but the thing is that when you're chasing these extreme ideals, when you have unhealthy relationships with food, when you have a, unhealthy relationships with body image, like, why aren't we going in and why aren't we helping people connect with their unique frame? Why aren't we helping people connect with their power? Um, why aren't we helping people heal their relationship with food? How? By understanding food. If you put food on your plate three times a day, you should understand food. Because through that understanding, you're going to make the right, the right choices for you. But beyond understanding food, you need to understand your body in relationship to that food because we're all different. So whatever works for one person is not going to work for the other person. But you know, what do all of these things have in common? Growing yourself up, taking responsibility and doing the work, which is a lot what a lot of the people just don't want to do. And this is why a lot of these procedures are also popular because it keeps people in that infantilized stage of, okay, let me be the authority figure, let me do it for you. And you just go be the child, never take responsibility for your choices. Or, you know, what happens to a lot of women is that they do try all these different things and they put their heart and all their effort but they're being misguided. And so they feel like they have done everything and they're just ready to give up, you know? Yeah. And so I'll tell you, you haven't done everything. You've probably done all the things that work against your body and damage your metabolism, but what you haven't done is you haven't learned how to become an expert in yourself. You have not healed your relationship with food. You have not healed your relationship with exercise, nor have you healed your relationship with body image. And that is what we need to do. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about that a bit more because that's so powerful. Um, but before we do, guys, anyone listening, you know, feel free to ask questions. You know, if, you, if you're familiar with any extremes that your clients or people you know or things you've read about that people are doing in order, you know, to try and look beautiful, you know, dying to be beautiful, you put it, please share it in the comments. You know, because the more that people can see this, the more it's going to start to wake people up. Because a lot of people, it just, it shocks them when they hear what's actually going on in the real world and what a lot of these doctors are recommending people do in order to try and heal their relationship with body image. It's just, it's crazy. Okay, I, I, have, I have two other stories that I, that I just remembered that I want to share. And um, one was this person in the entertainment industry that I was working with, um, or that I was gonna work with, actually. And uh, this person said to me that one of the artists that you know was her friend had just lost a whole bunch of weight and she was like what did you do so he's like oh i took these brazilian pills so she's like that's it give me the name whatever so she bought them she takes the pills she goes blind for 24 hours Jesus. okay blind for, 24 hours. Blind for 24 hours okay i think that these were the ones that had the amphetamines and i don't know god knows what else uh, and then i had this other client who had um, high blood pressure and you know and, and all these different things and um, headaches, you name it. And so they wanted him to lose weight and they put him on fat burners, stimulant type fat burners, which as you know, what it does is it just stimulates you, like puts you more like on a fight or flight response type thing. You've got somebody who's already on high blood pressure and you're gonna stimulate a fight or flight. Yeah. Uh, in his system, and then this person eventually developed an aneurysm. 
And this was done again by doctors. Yeah. You know, like they don't they don't look I, I don't know if he looked at the history, you know, and what was going on in this person's body, but the amount of people that are taking these fat burners and that are becoming addicted to the fat burners. And on top of that, there are massive amounts of caffeine. And some are even doing cocaine, you know, so that they don't because when you put yourself in these fat burners, it suppresses your appetite, it energizes you. You know, so that you can put more effort in the gym and this and this and that and work yourself harder. And, um, you know, and, and the combination, working yourself harder, not eating a lot because you're not hungry. Yes, it gives you aesthetic results, but at what metabolic cost? Yeah, and, and this is something that we're seeing a lot in the fitness industry. Well. It's, cool. it's, it's basically the, the masculization, right, of, of women and energy, basically. So what I mean by that is, the masculine energy is the drive, it's to achieve, it's the push, it's the fire that motivates you to achieve something. The feminine energy is more about the recovery and the nurturing, nurturing and sitting within and learning within and connecting within. And what we're seeing in the Western world, which is terrible, is the masculization of women and the and pretty much the dismissing and the disregard of the feminine energy. And we're seeing- can, I, can I pause you there, Mark? Sorry for a minute, so that this doesn't get taken out of context, because I know that people are very sensitive around this topic. Is it okay if I just come in and say something there, just so, so that they don't? Not to say no. No, I'm <laughs> go for it. All right. So you know, and this is something that Mark and I mentioned from the beginning when we were doing the series that we we're going to come in from the feminine and from the masculine energy, um, and that. Uh, basically what this means is this is not gender specific. It's just that both men and women can embody masculine and feminine traits. I'm going to give you an example so you understand this. So, for example, we have women who have completely embodied masculine traits. You can see a lot of these women in politics and they're the ones willing to go to war, fear monger, and they're trying to act like strong men and they're trying to be even stronger than men, than men so that they can survive that environment okay that's one example or it could be like i've had a lot of this you know like the go 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 getter wanting to run 20 businesses at a time and then on top of that train hard and this and this and this and just complete this complete dismissal for the feminine energy which is as mark was saying the invitation to recover from all that energy so it's like a energy output energy input masculine putting energy out feminine putting energy in and a lot of these fitness people because they're caught up in that masculine imbalance a lot of the business people because they're caught up in that masculine imbalance um moms as well oftentimes if they're single mothers and again no criticism it's just what they have to do um because of the circumstances complete masculinization because they have to be the providers protect defend etc all in one and all of those things lead to burnout okay so we're not talking man uh, men, women, we're talking about masculine or feminine traits that we can all embody. Okay, there we go. All right. So so we're seeing this more and more in, in the fitness industry. A lot of women are coming in with this sort of masculine shift to the point that they're turning their back on their feminine energy. And as Hemi said, we're not talking about male and female. We're talking about the masculine expression and the feminine expression. Right? We need to have balance. Right? As a guy, I need to step into my masculine in order to drive and achieve things and to be goal oriented, but also need to know when to pull back and shift into my feminine side and allow recovery and healing to take place in the body. So a lot of the people that were coming in, that's coming to see most of our trainers today, right, are actually showing the signs and symptoms of under recovery. It is massive to the point that recovery has become something of a negative now. Just like you hear people go, oh, I'm really cool because I only have four hours sleep a night. You know, so I can work harder. I'm an overachiever and I, you know, I do the grind, I do the hustle and I work, 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 push, push. And they think that's a really cool thing. And it, it's not because like anything, your ability to actually push or achieve always comes back to your ability to recover from the stress and the fatigue you've accumulated throughout that day. So recovery is so big and it, it's such a concern because we've talked about the AI or the artificial intelligence type look. But a lot of women in the fitness industry are striving to achieve fitness standards comparable to men in terms of body fat, in terms of athletic performance and proism and stuff like this. And it's not that men and women 
you know, like men are better than women or anything like that. It's we're equal, but we're not the same. There, there are differences that we need to respect. And yeah. women need to respect their feminine energy, not turn their back on it. So it always freaks me out when we see things like there was a, a lady that, that does CrossFit. Again, this is not about CrossFit. This is about a, a, a concept here. And she was kind of bragging because she was pregnant that she was going to be training right up to the day she gives birth. And then she guaranteed everyone that she'd be back training and running classes within five days after giving birth. Right? Now, this, this is crazy. Now, this is a time where you know, you're about to give birth and bring life into the world. You need to really shift into your feminine and connect. Remember, Remember we're talking about society's breaking down because there's a lack of intimate connection now. We're ripping away connection. We're moving away from it as we're going too much into the masculine and pushing and driving and achieving and trying to overachieve. So we need to be aware of that. And for every female watching as well, you know, and Hemi talks about the differences in the menstrual cycle, please take this away as well. If you're, especially if you're active and whether you run or you're into fitness and training and that, but please honor your feminine cycle, right? Please honor your menstrual rhythm because the body works on rhythms. Now, every female really should sort of step out of training and all that. If they can, I know there's some situations where they can't because they're competitive athletes and that, but for around the first sort of, you know, the day before and sort of the first three days of Menzies is a very important time for a female to do her inner work, to connect with self and to look within. Very, very important. Jumping around and running and training, lifting heavy, it's not a good idea. Even if you feel bulletproof, just remember that, you know, your uterus expands to twice the size and twice the weight during Menzies. It gets heavier. It puts more pressure on the pelvic floor. It can tilt forward or it can tilt back. Right, putting pressure on the bowels, which can cause constipation, or on the bladder, which creates that sort of feeling of urinary incontinence and things like that. So be aware of that because if you start jumping around, you are increasing the chances of you developing like you know things like prolapses and stuff later on. So honor the female body, honor the rhythms, right, and don't allow yourself to get pushed into this desire to masculinize yourself, turn you back in your feminine. Because the world has become about achieving these very unrealistic standards and women are now feeling the desire and the need to push and push and push and compete. And it's not the way it's meant to be. Okay, so I'll leave it at that because I can talk all day on this. Um, I know there's lots of things that Hemi wants to I, add. I want to add something uh, to that. And it's that um, because business is typically being run by men, um, also a lot of the research that has been done on exercise has also been done on men. You know, men are more linear, okay? So they can push, 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 right, a lot more, even though Mark was saying they also need that connection with recovery. But as women, because of our menstrual cycle, we are cyclical, okay? And I love the way that somebody that I respect tremendously in the field of sexuality and, um, you know, healing arts, uh, explain the Jiva. Sorry, you (laughs) do. It's a woman. Her name is Sajiva. Urtal, um, super wise woman. And the way that she explained it, and I loved it, it was like the seasons. So basically, uh, right after you get your period, you're like in a spring, okay? And this is a time when you can really push and you feel strong and you want to take on the world. And, you know, this is it. It's a spring. It's a rebirth. Then you're in the summer, okay? Like this is around the time when you're ovulating. And now you feel are flirtatious and sexy and delicious. And, you know, and whether you want to flirt with someone or whether you want to flirt with a business idea or whatever, like, or be creative, like this is a time for that. It's the summer. Um, Then comes the fall. And this is about, you know, the week or so before your period. And now maybe you start feeling a little bit more done. Maybe you want to stay home, get a little bit more creative, start going a little bit more into yourself. And then once you get your period, This is the winter, and what you typically want to do is hibernate and go inside yourself and disconnect. However, our society does not allow us to respect these cycles, and we're on the go, 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 and look at the amount of hormonal issues that women have. So if you're a woman and you train, or if you're um, a female trainer or a male trainer and you train females, you need to be aware of this because you need to keep this in mind as you're periodizing your programs. You know, and also diet changes. You know, I say to people, like, I, I don't, and I'm going to be talking more about this. I don't like the concept of dieting because dieting is static. I like the skill of eating. 
where I teach people or um, I give them some um, some tools so that they can learn to connect with their body, understand what their body needs at any given moment because our bodies are not static. They are dynamic. And our needs for food are going to change with climate. They're going to change with exercise. They're going to change with menstruation for women. They are going to change all the time. And it is up to us to be in tune enough to know how we need to tweak. When you have a diet, it's this rigid thing, okay, that somebody gave to you based on what worked for them or for God knows who else. But there's no consideration that you are a completely different human being. But we're going to be getting more into that um, at another time. So, you know, exercise, food, rest and recovery, all of these things need to be tweaked when you're a female. You need to understand your physiology because you cannot manage yourself like a man like a man and just be like a straight line you're like waves have you ever heard men say oh my god you're so um what what is it that, term that you guys used to describe us um huh annoying no <laughs> um something relating to sick like changing uh anyway i'm i'm forgetting the term i'll, I'll think about it and i'll let you guys know later so yeah so that's something very important um that we need to consider very very important so we're getting to the end because it's been an hour i can't believe how quick time flies it's, it's been an hour so we've really kind of unpacked the, the extreme measures that people take for the, these these ideals and stuff can i ask something babe? can we extend it just a few more minutes because i think that there's a couple of things that we need to cover before we go would that be okay I don't know. It depends on the people here. Guys, do you want us to go on a little bit longer? So if you do, just, just put a yes down there. I think they are getting the comments like a little bit late, babe. They're coming through a little bit late. Okay. All right. No, we, we can go a little bit longer. I'm sorry for not acknowledging comments. Like, I, I can't read and think <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so afterwards, we'll write. So what, what, what would you like to sort of end this on with? Like, what would you like to share? Yeah, well, I also want to say, um, well, what I wanted to add it was uh, what I wanted to add was some of the other extreme measures that people are resorting to. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, yes. Uh, they're coming through too. Okay, great. All right. So it's, it's yeah. Okay. So it's the extreme, the other extreme measures that we're seeing. Um, and we've spoken about fat burners. We're, we've spoken about um, um, cosmetic procedures. Uh, but what we haven't really spoken about is um, anabolic steroids and how popular they are. And also, you know, how we have this relationship where we don't eat enough and we overexercise so that we lose weight and we get petite. But then there's the other extreme, which is wanting to grow a lot. And the amount of drugs that people are putting themselves on but not only that the amount of food that they're eating we were talking about this today uh mark and i because we've actually seen it, quite a few documentaries on bodybuilders and um mark remembers a lot of them from his day i've never followed bodybuilding particularly so i'm not very familiar but i've learned a lot like through mark and he was telling me that a lot of his idols both in bodybuilding and like idols, you know, whatever, like, or the people he followed when he was a kid, um, both in wrestling and bodybuilding and are now um, dead. They, a lot of them have died in their 40s and so on. So what, what do you want to tell us about that, Mark? Because I think that that's really important and relative to the guys as well. Yeah, it, 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 everything always comes back to your relationship with yourself. And, you know, one of the things I, I always share with the students when I, when I first meet them is I always share my story of what got me into the fitness industry. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but basically it was from fear. It was a place of fear. I, I was beaten a lot as, as a child, and I kind of felt I needed to be to grow into being a bigger, stronger man and able to defend and protect myself from the people that were beating down on me. So like most of us, fear takes us to the gym and we start lifting weights, right? And if you look at it from a met metaphysical point of view, pushing is your ability to say no. This is why men love bench pressing. Right? It's our ability, it's called the exclusion principle, to push people away, to strike, to say no with authority. Right? Whereas pulling movements tend to be more the inclusion principle, the hugging and bringing people in. So a lot of us meatheads, well, I was a meathead, right? 
because of fear, we go too much into benching and pushing. We don't do so much pulling. We are her around the heart. Yeah, we, we build up our, our body armor for defense. And because I had fear around why I was at the gym, what I was trying to achieve, I had a very unhealthy relationship with the goal, right? It wasn't something that was inspirational. It was something that was based on desperation. So we tend to change for one or two reasons, inspiration, desperation. This was desperation that got me to the gym. So I started training and someone comes up to me and goes, hey, you know what? I can say some steroids. Now back then, I didn't really know what steroids did. I'd heard of them, but I didn't really know much about them. He pretty much told me, you know, you jab yourself and you'll, you'll accelerate your gains. You'll get really big, really strong, freaking quick. So that was like, you know, the, the, the money shot for me. That's what I needed. Okay, so I bought some. And I was sticking the needles in my ass. My girlfriend at the time was jabbing me and asking me steroids. And my body loved it. I went from about 85 kilos to about 98 kilos in five weeks. It was just insane. I had a face out here like this with fluid retention. Like most of that was fluid retention, but I was like this big tank walking along like this. So I got my emotional needs met. Right? I felt that I could protect myself. I felt intimidating. I felt like I could scare people. I felt authoritative. All that crap on the reason why I went there. So when you look at a lot of men, that get into the fitness industry. Again, it's usually from a place of desperation, not inspiration. It's people that have a very unhealthy relationship with themselves and they give their authority away to others. So they need external forms of validation. So how they feel about themselves in the moment is dependent upon whether they get approval or disapproval from the people around them, especially the people in their tribe. And you have these people now, they get their emotional needs met through being big, right? That gives them significance, they've found their validation, they've found where they belong, where they matter. They're this big hulk of a man. And that's how they get approval from that tribe or the people around them. And this becomes very seductive because like I said, this is the low road approach. You've come into training through the low road. You're engaging now in methods that work against the body, not with the body. And you get results that you couldn't get naturally going through the high road. You might get somewhere similar but nowhere near as quick as engaging in these low road methods. It's very, very seductive. So a lot of people do that. And then they get to this point, and it always used to fascinate me, where, and a lot of the Olympic athletes, when you know, they did a survey with Olympic athletes, and they said, if we were to give you a drug, and it was to guarantee that you'd win a gold in the upcoming Olympics, but you'd be dead within 12 months, would you take that drug? And it was something crazy, like about 50% of the athletes all said, yes, I would. That's how important achieving that marker was right that's how much significance they had placed right to achieve this meant more to them than their own life this is why you'll never get steroids out of bodybuilding and all that because at the end of the day because people are broken and they have this motivation which is driving desperation which comes from i am not enough and now they've grown into something where they get validation and they're experiencing significance right and drugs is the way to not only get there but to be the number one there is no way they'll ever say no to drugs because to say no to steroids and which comes with the risk of death and all these other stuff. Now, like a lot of people like to say steroids aren't linked to anything to do with you know heart damage and da 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 da. But at the end of the day, as you mentioned, when I look back at all my little favorite bodybuilders at the time, so many of them have passed away through heart failure, right? So many wrestlers in the WWF and the WWE have all passed away through heart failure or suicide or violence. So we tend to see a bit of a pattern there, all right? So these people, right, to achieve that level of significance becomes so important to them that they're prepared to not only engage in methods that put their body at risk, but they're prepared to engage in practices that could come with the consequence of death. And for some of them, because they're so lost, that's okay. It's worth it because they just need to belong and matter and have significance in their life and that is the path that gives them the significance and the validation that they so desperately seek because they're so lost and empty inside. So a yeah, lot they, of work, they do when we're in pain, you know, and again, we acknowledge the pain, not as a criticism, but as an observation that this is the driving force. Yeah. So we, we see this in guys, you know, as much as we see this in women as well. And it, it's really scary because sometimes, you know, I've sat down with people and I've said, look, you know, what is it you want to achieve? And you can tell, like, they've got a very unhealthy relationship with that goal. And when we sort of unpack it, I pretty much get to the point where they're saying to me, I'm prepared to take the low road, even though I say to them that if we take this approach, yes, we'll get you there, but you won't be able to stay there long term because extreme results take extreme measures, which are not sustainable long term. 
and also the damage by engaging in methods that work against the body, not with the body, you're pretty much going to throw yourself under the bus later on. And they'll look at me and they'll go, I don't care. I need to look that way as quick as possible. Yeah. Right? Because this is how distorted we are. And we have a society that is completely eroding away true connection and creating disconnection through like social media and all that. And we're pulling parents away. I mean, when I grew up, right, it was we, we had a we had a the ability to have a one income family. That, that's what it was like when I was a child, meaning, you know, my dad could work and my mum could be at home and you could get by on one income, right? So that relationship between the masculine and feminine that created a stable family unit was, was in place. Nowadays, it's so hard for one income. It's, we've shifted into women having to work. Now, I know this is not about women, you know, should they work or not, I'm not getting into that because I, I think women whatever they want to do. All right. Like you're the most supportive with yeah. my career and my work, so that's not what he's saying. Yeah, what I'm saying now is that we're in a society where women are forced into work because gone are the days people being able to survive on one income, right? It needs two income. In fact, two income families are still struggling. So it breaks down the family unit and it disconnects the child. And then the, the parents are no longer the gatekeepers for what gets into that child's mind because now children are being raised through TV, through internet, through social media, right? And it's completely distorting the reality. It's completely distorting and skewing their idea of self and the reason for being. It, it's getting out of hand. So we're getting these children now that are so disconnected and so lost in their stories of I'm not enough. Because think about it. How could you feel like you're enough if even your own parents weren't there for you and didn't show any interest or you know, any attention was given to you. So we have all this fear and it just gets propagated and propagated and propagated to the point now that when you look at what's happening in the world, right, it is just all the symptoms of people that are so lost inside and desperately trying to be validated and desperately trying to find connection and desperately trying to find a way to belong and a way to matter that it's, it's getting scary, you know? And so... And social media just exacerbates the problem because um, if you've noticed, the more extreme the body is, the more extreme the person is, the more followers. And, you know, and the thing is that social media really is an addiction um, or addictive. It was designed based on what a lot of the people uh, in Silicon Valley are saying now. It was designed to make people addicted. Like you, ma you have massive dopamine release when you see a like, when you see certain imagery, when you see certain things, and this is when people get stuck on that wall, scrolling, 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 with the novelty that's coming up all the time and all the dopamine hits that, hits that they get. And when they get a like, that's like a massive dopamine release. You know, like I've, I've seen it, you know, the way that I've navigated social media has been very much like first going in like everybody did and then just kind of stepping back and going like, what am I doing? Like, for example, you know, like, uh, I don't know like, when I joined the Instagram was probably like 2014, I think, because I, I joined a little late. And um, and then I was going out to a place and I was thinking, babe, can we take a picture here? And I was like, oh, my God, like I'm not enjoying my life. I'm not just, just to take a picture to show somebody where I'm at. Who cares? Who cares? So we like about Gary V. He, he's saying that yeah. people today are actually planning their weekends and their getaways based on the selfies they could take. I mean, what, what does that say? Yeah. So, you know, this is social media is parenting us. Social media is validating us. Social media is inspiring us. And as we spoke in the first presentation, we need to learn how to self-validate. We need to learn how to self-explore. Sorry. Well, obviously, we need to self -have, learn how to self-explore so we can do this. So we, but we, so we can self-inspire and self-validate. And so we don't become dependent on this. Now, even if you know how to self-inspire and self-validate, remember these things are designed to cause addiction. And then if you put all of the other elements that Mark was describing into the equation, we have a mess in our hands. And the kids, you know, are watching all of this stuff. And I'm gonna, as I was saying yesterday, the amount of little girls with image disorders now, I'm gonna share a story I read. I am not sure if this is actually true, but this was a case of a nine-year-old who had breast implants because she started crying every day saying that she was depressed because she couldn't get her 
boob job. And they took her to the psychologist or the psychiatrist, and he said that, yeah, that they needed to give her breast implants because if not, she was going to go into a massive depression. And the little girl got her breast implants. So this is the kind of stuff, you know? And, and I was saying yesterday, like, children see how their mothers relate to their bodies, and they learn from there. So, like, I am urging women to heal this relationship with themselves you know, and men as well, because this is what we're passing down to the next generations. Like in my particular case, in my growing up, it was bad. It was never as bad as this. And it impacted me. And it impacted a lot of the girls in school. I'll tell you, like I, I mentioned that I was growing up um, late 80s, early 90s. And um, that was during my teenage years. And the models became very popular. And I'm going to tell you what happened in my particular case. So first, I was very sick with asthma, blah, 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 um, growing up. And then um, with puberty, my appetite just went out of hand. And, um, you know, and I just couldn't control my appetite and stuff. And I also thought appetite was the enemy and all this stuff. And as a teenager, um, I tried, I, okay, first what I would do is I would starve myself during the day. Like I would start the day starving, uh, not eating anything. And then I would go for as long as I could. And I felt like I was in control. Okay, I, I had control of the situation, but then Mother Nature kicked in with a vengeance. And so I would have like these hunger pants and I would like literally stuff my face with food. And I've had a lot of clients th who go through these patterns. Um, and, you know, and then what happened was, you know, of course, this wasn't helping my appetite. It wasn't helping my weight. So the next thing I did was I went into my mother's cabinet, medicine cabinet, and I took some pills that they had given her at some spa. And I took those, but they didn't do anything. So I just quit that. That was like two weeks. But then the next thing I did was this. I went and I purged myself. So I ate a whole bunch of stuff. And then I purged. I did that for maybe like five days or so until I was so grossed out with the whole procedure and just the burning in the esophagus. And I swore to myself I would never do that. And then... You know, I found this book. I went down the path of, you know, becoming a vegan. That initially helped me with many things. Eventually, it destroyed my health. That's a completely different story um, that I'm not going to get into today. We can discuss it some other day. But, um, but during that time when I was a vegan, what happened was that I dropped to 100 pounds. And I was, you know, like on top of the world because I was super skinny. But what I didn't understand was that the reason why I was so skinny was because I had a ton of inflammation, even though I was eating an organic diet, making sure I was getting my proteins right, you know, like only organic whole foods, you know, like uh, not crap. Anyway, um, and I had so much inflammation that I could not absorb nutrients, but I thought that I was super healthy. You know, and I was just like super skinny. So this whole thing, and I'm, I'm telling you, this wasn't even as extreme back then as it was today. And it took me on this whole path, which I am so grateful for, by the way, because, you know, like the best teacher is experience. And there's something that I want to add to that. And we've been talking about um, a lot of these ideals and a lot of these procedures and I know that a lot of women may be connecting with maybe pain or shame because they also have followed this path. And what I want to say to that is this, my dear friend, you have something that no book, no course, no coach can never give you. And that is the experience. You have connected with what isn't. And now you're in the perfect place to recognize what is. Because you have already gone down the, down, down the uh, low road approach. You have seen that a lot of these measures may work temporarily, but at the expense of your health. And now you're in a perfect place to really heal. You see, it's so hard to work with people that still are, are under the beauty spell and are under the idea that these wicked measures are going to fix their life. Um, but... You know, like you can't convince these people they are under a spell, you know, and they're just going to go into denial. They're going to get aggressive, you name it. But the women that have already experienced the pain and that are already at that turning point, you guys, you know, just know that you are ready for that transformation and for some real healing and to take back power 
over your body. You have always had power over your over your body. It's just that you didn't know how to tap into it. And these are the tools that we're trying to share with you. Right, right. All right, Hemi, right. Hemi. I'm going to have some second. So, I'm, so happy, I'm happy closing there. Yeah, that, that, yeah. Was, that was beautiful. The way that you used this, that was, was incredible. Like, I really felt it. That's great. So thank you for everything. Like, I mean, this is something that you can tell him he is very, very passionate about. This whole idea of helping people, men and women, heal their painful relationship with food and body image. How to become an expert in yourself. Because at the end of the day, guys, what's the point in looking good if you feel like shit? Right? <laughs> what is the point? And we know so many people that on the outside look great. Right? They've been beautifully designed. They've been beautifully manufactured to look these ideals and standards that so many women can't achieve, right? But they feel terrible. That's not what you want to experience in life. So this is all about taking your power back and looking good because you feel good. And, and I've worked with many of those women, sorry, that yeah. look amazing and are having the amount of health problems that you could not even imagine, even in their 20s or younger than that. Yeah. So we've got three more interviews in the series. Um, no, five. No, 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 wait. We've done, today was four. We've got seven. Yeah, three. Three more. So tomorrow, I think we're going to get a little bit more into nutrition and food. Is that correct? Um, well, I was thinking tomorrow getting into reward and punishment type relationships. Um, and we may be able to go into uh, food. Great. Yeah, we might start going into food. So it all depends on the time. Awesome. All right, guys, so we'll see you tomorrow. Come and join us again around the same time tomorrow. Uh, actually, hang on. No, we're going to have to amend the time because I've got other commitments tomorrow. But, oh, we'll let you know. Yeah, we'll probably be a little bit, bit earlier tomorrow. But thank you for joining us. Again, we want to get this out to as many people as we can because it's time for everything to change. We want everyone to look good because they feel good. Take your power back. All right, so we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you for your time today. And we'll look forward to catching up again. Okay, bye.